It's May, the start of six months of glorious weather in Australia's remote north. Adventurer Malcolm Douglas is back in the Kimberley, travelling on smooth seas in search of one of Australia's most prized sporting fish, the mighty barramundi. With two mates and his dog, he'll spend weeks exploring the rugged gorges, tidal rivers and muddy inlets. Barramundi live in the clear freshwater rivers and billabongs and downstream in the muddy estuaries and bays. For Malcolm, the ultimate fishing excitement is watching the big barra jump. From Derby in the northwest, it's a long two-day trip to Walcott Inlet, one of Australia's most remote and dangerous tidal waterways. Malcolm's cattle dog Bundy never misses a trip. Forty nautical miles in from the open sea, the tide still rises and falls ten metres and the muddy, swirling waters are alive with fish. The most common are pop-eyed jumping mullet, and they attract big barramundi. This is why there are so many barramundi in this part of the country, because you've got an abundant supply of food. You've got literally millions and millions of these pop-eyed jumping mullet, and they're the best bait for barramundi. With no sinker, the bait drifts out on the ebbing tide, and within minutes, there's a hookup. This barramundi's an average size for these remote Kimberley tidal estuaries. It's the beginning of the fortnightly cycle of the huge spring tides and the stronger rush of water attracts even more bait fish. Just below the surface, the big threadfin salmon and barramundi hurl themselves into a feeding frenzy, lunging at the seething mass of mullet. On the rising water, Saltwater crocodiles are surrounded by an abundant supply of food. At high tide, it's deep enough to motor up the Charnley, the river flowing into Walcott Inlet. The low muddy banks give way to Kimberley sandstone gorges. So far inland, there's only enough water right at the top of the tide to manoeuvre the boat for a few minutes, where the murky salt water meets the fresh water at a series of rock bars. Once the tide drops, the boat's stranded for 12 hours.
Beyond the rock bars, calm waterways are ideal spots to catch barramundi. For Malcolm, these are some of the best places in Australia to fish. Remote wilderness, warm days, and barramundi on the bite. These impulsive and voracious feeders test sporting tackle to the limit. Inexperienced anglers usually lose their first few barra until they learn to anticipate the fighting characteristics of this aggressive fish. Bundy's never far away when barra Mundi's on the menu. these long trips, that's at least twice a day. Dawn breaks on another perfect morning. Malcolm plans to cross to the other side and trek up river. On the low tide, the current flowing over the rock bar presents a challenge but the force of the water will keep crocodiles away. Bundy has no idea of the danger, so a safety rope is vital. Without the safety rope, she would have been swept away. A bamboo hand spear comes in handy as Yannick transfers the gear to the other side. Every year, barramundi swim upstream on the wet season floods and live in permanent pools where the river level drops. Here, where the water surges between the rocks, the bigger barrel lurk, waiting to ambush the smaller fish. When you're targeting a particular species of fish, you've got to use the right sort of lure. It's no point using a lure like this little one here that only swims to one metre if your fish are right down in the shadows in about five or six metres of water. When you buy your lures, it's usually indicated along the bottom here. Like this, it says scorpion dives to five metres. Now, it depends on the shape and the angle of the bib on the front and the shape of the lure. See, that one's got a very big, wide bib. This one here, which only dives to one metre, has got a little tight bib. I'm going to fish today in this clean water here, about two or three metres, so... I'm going to have a go with his RMG and it's going to go down to three or four metres, brightly coloured lure. Let's get it out of here. Right, I just see how that's going to work. Barramundi are exciting to catch, often leaping high out of the water, so the angler sees the fish long before it's landed. In clear water, a barra will see a flashing lure, but in dirty water, it senses vibrations through a lateral line along each side of its body. This is why bright-coloured lures with a rattle are so successful. A few quick shots, and it's straight back into the water. 
That's what we come to the Kimberley for. Beautiful barramundi like that. Look at it. Great big freshwater barra. Quite a magnificent fish. Barramundi change sex as they mature. Young barra, under 80 centimetres in length, are males. And over 80 centimetres, they're usually females. There he is. That's actually a female, of course, being that big. Take in the water. It's best to release all large fish. They're the breeders. From a rocky ledge high above the water, Malcolm hooks a nice barramundi on a fly. It's legal size and will be just the thing for lunch. At midday, the men find a shady camp to cook the fish on the coals and rest before the long trek back to the boat. These smaller fish are sooty grunter, commonly called black brim. Nearby, Malcolm's appalled to find a recently abandoned camp littered with rubbish. Even dangerous broken glass. This is an absolute disgrace. Why would anyone bother to come into a pristine wilderness and leave it like this? These irresponsible people have arrived in a helicopter, then departed leaving their garbage behind. Malcolm will dispose of it back in Broome. High in the Millilucas, a colony of flying foxes roost. Common throughout the coastal regions of North Australia, they become agitated as the men pass below, shrieking raucously to warn off the intruders. During the brightest time of the day, Barramundi lays in the shadows, barely moving, the overhead sun affecting their vision. So early morning or late in the afternoon is the best time to fish. Heading back to camp, Malcolm tries another way to get across the bar. But it's just as dangerous. The rocks are covered with slippery algae. Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! At the end of the day, there are few places as beautiful as the Kimberley.
and its barra cooked on the coals for tea. The tides are now too low to reach right up the rivers, so Malcolm heads for the countless reefs and islands off the mainland. The dropping tide forces the fish into the deepest holes. This is the perfect time to flick a fly. Within seconds, he's hooked a small trevally. A whaler shark tries to grab his fish, then lunges at Malcolm's leg. Kimberly fishing. Oh, first cast, nice trevally. Six foot whaler, took my fish. Still got to get a feed. Stick another fly on. And see what we can do. The sun's going down, got another half an hour. It should do me all right, I think. Little red popper. Quite a strong current here to catch the line behind me, so better get this line out fairly quickly. Righto, here we go. Out in the water. Righto. Yeah, no, hey. More sharks move in. Quits till the morning. At first light, they're out on the reef again. Bundy, never far from Malcolm's side, is not too impressed with fly fishing. His efforts are rewarded with a good sized finger mark. One of the best eating fish on the coast. On the rising tide, they work the rocky headlands looking for pelagic fish. There's heaps of fish on the sounder now. It's mid-afternoon. Time to get a fish or two for tea. Around here there are big numbers of sharks and they're very aggressive. So hand lines are used to land the fish quickly. Within seconds a big golden trevally hits one of the lures. Another Kimberley fish. Look at the size of it. Oh. It's just too big for a meal. But the smaller queenies are always on the bite. I've been after a Spanish mackerel for days. <laughs> and that's all I've got. Look at it. Shoot off my... These whalers! Oh! There they are, all under the boat. Look at them here. Before moving on, Malcolm tries jigging a silver spoon. But the sharks are now just too agitated.
A few kilometres further on, Malcolm flicks a lure in shallow water where sharks are rarely seen. Got a good queenie on. There we are. When you're on a long trip, good food is very important. Got two fish here, a queen fish and a trevally. I'm gonna cook them two entirely different ways. The first way is straight on the coals. Make sure you don't have any flame. Just drop the fish in on the hot sand and cover it over. You don't even have to gut the fish and it holds all the juices. Make sure you don't have any flame because it will spoil the fish. Leave that there for about 15 minutes. Very good way to keep the juice in and um, to cook a fish when you're in a hurry. Right, now the second way, I'm gonna cook this trevally, which is not one of the best eating fish. Few additives, entirely different way. I'll go and do that now. To cook this trevally, I've got various ingredients that you can carry in a boat. Noodles, Coconut milk, powdered form, tin mangoes, and onions. Onions will last for weeks. Ideally, you want a very even heat, no flame, olive oil, and first thing that goes in are the onions. Cook the onions first, a bit more oil, and the trevally cut up into small pieces, straight into the pan. While that fish is cooking in the pan, our queen fish, which is still under the coals, should be ready. So it's just a matter of removing the coals picking your fish up and presenting it on the table. There you are. Once you pull the outside skin off, the meat is perfect. Once the fish is ready, everything goes in. The onions, which were cooked earlier, in they go, starting to look good, smell good. The mangoes and their juice, mix it all up. Oh, look at this. The noodles, which we've cooked in another pot. In go the noodles. Righto, now, the last thing is the coconut milk. Mix the coconut milk powder with water. Nice and creamy. Pour it over the lot. Simmer that for about five or 10 minutes and it'll be just magic. You want some? You want some? In the morning, there's a very low tide. Now, I just have to be patient, wait for the tide to come in, then we can go and flick a lure. Three hours later, with the first movement of the incoming tide, black tip reef sharks and bronze whalers cruise in the shallows. Soon there will be ample water to hunt across the reef. Turtles too feed on the reef as the tide rises. 
By midday, it's high tide and the mangroves are teeming with fish. A big halco lure should create some action. Trevally pounce on the lure and the ever-present sharks are not far behind. These sharks, look at them in the water here, look. Come a fish. <laughs> oh, that's awesome stuff. They two metre, two and a half metre whalers and about uh, about one metre black tip reef sharks. <laughs> I was just quietly filleting a couple of trevally here, the stern of the boat. One of the fish slipped in the water and bang, the sharks came from everywhere. After I've taken the fillets off this one, I'll just let it out the back here and show you just how ferocious these sharks really are. for a glutton. Look at that. That's a live shark. He just won't let go of the tail. He's gone into a trance. Oh, hey! <laughs> hey. By late afternoon, the tides dropped 10 metres. Malcolm's motored off the reef, heading back to the mainland and on to Walcott Inlet and the Isdell River. Sections of this coast are still uncharted and submerged reefs and rocks are a constant hazard. Pillars can be badly damaged, so plenty of spares should always be carried. We're now at the mouth of the Isdale River, waiting for the tide to come in. There's sandbars everywhere. There's no chance of getting up the river. We can't get up the muddy banks to get any wood, so just have some instant soup here while we're waiting. We're trying to get up to the top of the Isdell. Great place for big barramundi. When the rising tide surges up the Isdell, it's an awesome spectacle. These tides are some of the biggest in the world. A few kilometres from the mouth, the river runs through the Isdell Gorge, winding far into the hinterland. It's one of the great Kimberley Gorges.
This is a dangerous place for boats. Local knowledge is essential. Few people ever venture so far upriver. In the shadows of the rocks, barramundi lie in wait and the fishing's great. Inquisitive saltwater crocodiles are never far from the boat. Towards evening, the crocs become even more curious, often hanging around all night. Next day, on one of the biggest tides of the month, the men manoeuvre the boat between submerged boulders to the last deep hole before the cascades. The custom-built 6.1 metre renegade with its strong aluminium hull is ideal for these rocky conditions. With no time to fish during the day, Malcolm and Bundy hook some sooty grunter for tea. I always feel very privileged to be out in these wilderness areas. And something else that's very special is making up your own saltwater flies. The table's not very flash, but the view, the scenery is really spectacular. And once I've finished making up this fly, I'm going to go and have a crack at catching a Big barramundi. Before I leave home, I always get some of these guinea fowl feathers for my pet guinea fowl because I like them in a fly. They look like scales. See them on the side there? Righto. Now, one little bit of colour up the front. Just to finish it off, a pair of eyes, which will add a bit of weight to the fly and get it down a couple of metres fairly quickly. Just fix it in there. Looks pretty good. Should catch me a fish. A fly looks unconvincing out of water, but when it's wet, it closely resembles a live bait fish. To get to the best fishing holes, the men will have to hike upstream, and they make several trips across the river with their gear.
There are few destinations in Australia as remote as this part of the Western Kimberley. For Malcolm, fishing is a complete experience. Being part of the wilderness, casting the line so that the fly lands in just the right spot, the thrill of the strike, landing the fish, even if it's only small, then releasing it. Large fly excites schools of small barramundi. Not all the fish landed are barra. This is a small tarpon. The ultimate thrill for any fly fisherman is a strike from a really big fish. And Malcolm's hooked one now. Happy fisherman, have a look at one now. That is a magnificent barramundi to catch on a fly. It's every fisherman's ambition to land a big barra on fly. We haven't got any fish for lunch, but a fish that size, I've just got to let him go. Returning to camp, Bundy wants to help, but she's pulling the wrong way. With fresh fish needed for the evening meal, Malcolm flicks a mullet. Within seconds, he's hooked a good sized barra. Ow! Can't get him. Can't get him. Cut my fingers. I got a nice barra down here. Probably about 10 metres down, I just can't lift him up with this line. This is my tea down here. What I'm going to try and do is get a second line, get a second hook in him, we'll lift it with two rods. Take two fish in there. 
me. There's no better way to start the day. Casting a fly in gorges splashed with gold by the morning sun. Days later, Malcolm's back in the muddy tidal waters. He's after some big mullet. The bigger the bait, the better the chance of catching a really big barramundi. With large mullet, there's little risk of catching the spiky catfish. The tide's right and the fish are really on the bite. And there's another big Kimberley barramundi. Look at that. What a beautiful fish. My gum. Just get it out of the net and I'll show you the true size and colour of these salt saltwater barramundi. There we are. Look at that. Oh. What would he be? I'll be. 15 kilos, I'd say. Oh, put him back, he's a bit heavy. 